Hello everybody, my name is Paul Buitink and today I'm joined by uh, Brad Scott, sort so. of the, the main defender of cash in, uh, in the UK. <laughs> Welcome uh, Brad in the studio. Yeah, it's cool to be here. Thanks we're, for getting me in. Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, the cashless society today. All right, good You're stuff. an author, uh, you, you wrote a book, um, The Heretics Guide to Global uh, Finance. Hacking the Future yeah. of Money. Exactly, a very interesting book and you have recently been uh, speaking a lot in the media about the dangers of the cash society and why the war on cash is not a just thing. Mm -hmm. um, but let's first start 10 years ago because you actually um, applied for a job at Lehman Brothers. Yeah, Tell I did. Tell me a bit more about that one. Yeah, so actually I was, I have a background in anthropology and uh, history and various kind of like non-financial uh, subjects. Um, but I worked out that actually, you know, a large part of the world's power resides within the financial sector and I was working with activist groups, I was working on activist movements and I realized that I knew absolutely nothing about finance. So I was talking about it a lot, but I didn't actually know anything about it. So I thought to myself, what would be like an interesting experiment? You know, um, and, and essentially what I, 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 de I designed a kind of quasi anthropological adventure onto the dark side. Um, and so, yeah, I was in South Africa, so I'm from... So I cut off my hair, bought a suit and went to London and tried to get a job in the financial sector. Oh, not like this then? No, no, no I didn't look like this. Um, I got my first suit and I was totally like clean shaven and everything. And yeah, I managed to get some interviews with Lehman Brothers. But this was actually, so I guess, August, August 2008. So just before it went wrong? Literally like a few weeks before they went bust. And I had one interview and it went kind of well. Um, and then I had a second interview. But at this, this point, I, 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 the, the guys were like, you know, you might have seen stuff up by us in the press. And we were, we were up on like the 35th floor of this, like, you know, it was like uh, one bank. It's ivory the, tower. Yeah. yeah, in Canary Wharf. And like, you know, you might have seen all this stuff in the press, but, you know, don't worry, things are cool. You know, it's, everything's solid. Fake news. Yeah, yeah. And if I had got that job, I basically would have arrived at work and then been fired the next day because uh, the company went bust. Uh, so you would, you would have been one of those guys with the, with the box walking outside and uh, yeah, I feel I feel sorry for whoever did get that job, or maybe they didn't get get, get around to even appointing somebody because the whole company went under, of course. Yeah, but um, then you did work a few years in the financial industry. Yeah, so I actually I ended up getting a, jo a job in as a uh, derivatives broker. Um, so uh, swap contracts, these big bets in the financial market. So I worked for two years as a derivatives broker, in the midst of the financial crisis which was an interesting experience. Yeah, and then when did you write the book, The Heretics Guide? The Heretics Guide to Global Finance came out in 2013. So actually I wrote it in 2012. Um, but that was, that was uh, commissioned by Pluto Press, which is a publisher in the UK. And they wanted a, a guide to the financial sector for activists. And because I had a sort of background in activism, but then it also had financial experience, they asked me to do it. And I, yeah, so I, I, I produced that. And it was basically a guide to the financial sector, but then also a guide to how you might um, challenge the power of the financial sector and how you might build alternatives, you know, which include alternative banks, alternative money systems, um, and many things like that. Yeah. yeah. So you, like local monies, cryptocurrencies, all these different alternatives you are studying and you're seeing whether they can be uh, used sure, in, yeah. in, a, in a good way. Yeah, and there's, there's lots of different traditions of alternative currency yeah. and monetary reform. And there's different approaches people take. So what I've often tried to do is to sort of spend time. Um, I, as I said, I've got this kind of anth anthropological background and this anthropological impulse, which often means you know you try get you go into groups, you try to sort of see how they think, um, how they see the world. So you know, I did I did that with the financial sector, but I also now do it with you know, cryptocurrency communities or with like, you know, people building local currencies or tech people, just trying to get a sense of how people see, you know, how they imagine what the problems are <clears throat> and how and what they think the strategies are for, for changing those. Um, yeah, and how come you're so worried about this trend uh, that we see over the past few years and increasingly so that cash is being kind of Erated, sort of abolished uh, to a certain extent, that you have less and less opportunity to use gas. So, some people say it's a war on cash. Maybe sure, it's yeah, a bit yeah. dramatic uh, because I, I guess a lot of war victims would feel offended if we use the term yeah. war for this. But maybe war, a cold war. A cold war, yeah. Sort of like behind the scenes. Behind the scenes. War. Is yeah. it is it that nefarious? Are there actors behind the scenes uh, working actively to to get rid of cash in society? I think so. Yeah. I mean, just bear in mind, this, this cashless society topic is, um, I guess I've recently become a kind of a 
commentator on it over the last couple of years. I was originally drawn into it because I was working on money systems and you know, money more generally. And I noticed that a lot of the articles being written about digital money systems or about cashless society were one very uncritical about it, sort of showed no sort of signs of having it was very, very one sided. It was just like you know, digital money is obviously good. It's obviously this kind of thing. Um, and two, they often had quite, you know, sort of poor understanding of monetary systems were presenting this kind of, you know, like they, there's a lot of problems in how the, the, the topic was being spoken about. So I started writing about it to try and give a more balanced opinion or try to give, a, I guess, a sort of a counter story. Because bear in mind that the main actors who've been pushing out the story about cashless society are commercial actors who stand to benefit from it. In, in particular, um, the financial technology industry, the payments industry, these are the, the ones who often produce the, have sort of created that story over time. Um, which is not to say that they are the only ones who are somehow implicated in this. I mean, it, it's a much more complex question, but they're the ones who sort of dominated the media story about cash to society. Yeah. So I felt it was important to start putting out a counter story about it. So I started writing these articles and they did quite well. And I actually discovered that this cashless society topic um, resonates with a lot of people. What kind of people uh, are, are um, mostly um, sort of sympathetic to your ideas? There's a strangely like a wide range of people actually, from conservatives through to, you know, radical activists through to like, there's a lot of different people. And it's interesting because if you do, um, uh, other forms of financial activism or financial campaigning, often there's like, especially if you're doing stuff around like, you know, investment banks and high finance, lots of people don't feel that they really can understand it or have anything to say about it. So they feel confused about it. But when you start talking about everyday, everyday money systems, your, you know, your everyday experience of a payment system and you're using cash, a lot of people have an opinion. So actually it's a strange, it, 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 there's a, you know, for example, you get like elderly people in northern, northern England who will suddenly start commenting on my articles about cash or society. And of course, they would never comment on an article about, you know, for example, like a you know, much more technical monetary reform. Yeah, because they suffer the daily consequences. Yeah, it's something yeah. you experience in a tangible kind of way in your everyday life. So actually, I find it's an interesting way to, um, you know, aside from the political issues around it, to actually engage people about finance because it's something they, they have personal experience of and they have opinions of. Um, I mean, my last Guardian article on this, I think it had something like 2,500 comments. You know, That's was, a lot. There was like people... And mostly, uh, f mostly defending your side of the story? or A combination of both. It's or did the payments industry use bots and trolls to... Nah, I mean, no, 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 you, of course, you get a bunch of people who come on and they say... There's like three camps, basically. There's, there's like... Um, people who feel concerned about the pace of technological change and feel a bit like you know, actually we quite like using cash. I, I, I feel suspicious about these systems. You have a lot of people who are quite pro-cash. Um, then you get the kind of people who are like, oh, but it's so convenient, stop thinking about the past and kind of stuff, you know, like, oh, I use credit cards all the time, you know, and they say that. And then there's the third group, I don't know if you can probably predict who they are, but it's, it's the Bitcoin community who always comes and comments on, on my pieces and says, yes, but Bitcoin has like solved this issue. Um, so it's quite like an interesting combination of people who, who kind of like get involved in the debate. Um, Let's go to the first group, like the, um, I guess the marginalized people, so elderly possibly that are not uh, used to be that digital and they, they see the ATM is, is, is leaving their, their town and they have, they have to cross bigger distances to get, get their hands on cash money. They see stores where they can't use cash anymore mm -hmm. and they kind of lose track perhaps of their budgets. Uh, what, is, what is the main problem that the elderly have with uh, the disappearance of cash? I mean, it's, I, mean I, don't, I don't claim to be an expert on you know, every elderly person's experience of, 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 of these systems, but the, I guess with some people it, it, it's related to the tech industry more generally. You know, like there's a lot of concern about digitization of processes that were previously tangible and you, you've grown up with. Um, so to some extent, there's a kind of a, a nostalgia of some sort, um, or at least, like, you, know, I'm, you know, somebody's used to using a certain system and then feels it being taken away from them. Um, and I guess there's a, especially when it comes to your financial life, people feel quite, it's quite a taboo subject or it's quite like a, it's quite an emotional subject, you know? 
So if suddenly you're a person who's, who's used to be operating in an economy in a certain way and you suddenly feel that a whole bunch of people are, are slowly making it harder for you. Um, for example, if, you, if you're a person who actually wants to retain the use of cash, but you suddenly see all these shops around you who's just suddenly saying, no, we're not going to accept it. And you see these young people who are like, oh, yeah, stop, you know, you're kind of in the past. You feel like you basically like, don't have a say anymore in how this stuff works. So there's that, there's that, that kind of impulse. Um, but you also find people who are concerned about the negative consequences of cash. So like on the one hand, this is kind of like we're used to a certain system and we don't want it to change. But then on the other hand, there's this like the new system that's coming has negative consequences. So like the anti-surveillance activists, for example. Yeah. Get so you're one of them basically, right? Yeah, so there's all these negative sides to cash of society like that are what will be, will be talked about. So surveillance is one of them. Um, exclusion is another one. Um, so like the, the refugees, for example, that enter a country without uh, residence, without bank accounts, and they cannot participate, they cannot yeah, pay, yeah. pay I mean, for and anything. If, but the basic way to put this is um, the, if, you, if, you think, if you go to a, an ordinary like, economics, introductory economics textbook, the first thing they always like, talk about is there's, there's these two players in a the market. There's a buyer and a seller. Okay? Um, and like one person hands over money and the other person hands over goods. Right? And then this is like the sort of standard unit of like economics. Uh, a cashless society always adds a third player in. So they have to add in this new player, which is basically the person who takes money from the one person and gives it to the other person. So it's like a money passer. Yeah. And it's usually two banks. Yeah, so actually it's, it's of two, course, two the reality banks. of who that person is, it's actually the banking system, yeah. of course, right? But essentially what you will have is you have, you have an intermediary inserting itself between every economic interaction. Now, the surveillance stuff stems from that. So now as soon as you have this person who stands in between every transaction, of course they can watch what's happening. But the exclusion question is also related to that because if you're a person who can't get a bank account, you're essentially now unable to engage in normal economic transactions. Of course, we're quite, we're quite far away from that happening, but this is becoming... Well, to a certain extent, if you look at uh, how uh, Julian Assange or Wiki, uh, WikiLeaks was treated, or how Iran is treated by being yeah, yeah, sure. uh, shot off swift, and it's, uh, the sort of censorship in that sense already takes place. Yeah, yeah. So actually, the censorship thing is almost like another category. So <clears throat> once you can watch transactions, you can then stop them. Yeah. So the WikiLeaks case is a very well-known example of this. Um, in, in science fiction, some of the, the, the probably the best-known example is uh, Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale, um, which has now been made into this series that people might be watching. But one of the ways, and essentially in The Handmaid's Tale, like, uh, the women are subjugated in, in this kind of theocratic state. But the, how they managed to, to do this was to eliminate the cash system and replace it with a thing called CompuBank, which basically meant that it gave, it gave the authorities far more control over, over women's lives. And actually, so if you read The Handmaid's Tale, this was, this was done in the 1980s. It's one of the first, the first sort of dystopian, on, very, dystopian yeah. views of like what a cash society could be. So like that's the kind of like, you know, like people get, a, get sort of start thinking about like, yeah, what happens actually if there was like a you know, a really dodgy government that suddenly had the ability to sort of turn certain people off. Well, in, in China, of course, with the social credit system, you can already be um, based on your spending behavior. You yeah, can already yeah. get a penalty or, or no, absolutely. Uh, be um, excluded to certain services, like uh, not being able to priority board when you go to, uh, when you go travel or something like that. Totally. Any, any system that has remote monit monitoring um, potentially also has remote control. So like if you have the ability to watch things, but also to like send messages to stop those things and, and, and digital communications technology is the technology that enables this, right? So like you, you can watch stuff, but you can also stop stuff. So, and the thing about cash is that it's essentially it's an offline money system. So like no remote authority can say, I'm going to stop you from doing that. And I'm going to sort of, you know, freeze it or something like that. You could, it, it, it moves without the need for any kind of authorities. Yeah. So, and then this probably brings up the final uh, kind of point, which is that um, if you're thinking about the kind of like resilience of economies, um, as soon as you have your money system sort of centralized into these kind of big digital databases, I mean, if those databases go down, your entire money system can go down. And if your entire money system goes down, your whole economy st stops. Yeah, like a few um, months ago, I was having dinner at a restaurant and then we had a big um, outing of, 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 the, of the money system, the, the PIN system. So for like, I don't know, like two hours or so, 
people couldn't use their pimples and most people were were not having any cash on them so yeah, i course. actually i was i was just about to to pay and i couldn't uh, use my card so i actually had to give my email address to the restaurant owner so he could send me an invoice afterwards and of course i paid the invoice uh, when i when i got it but there was just panic because the, the, most people didn't have cash with them um, so yeah. there was there was something I guess that's an no that happened it happened in the mean. UK as well actually the the visa system went down um, and just just to, to like like the a cashless society I mean it's essentially a euphemism for like the bank payment society right so in the end what you're doing is you mo you're moving deposits between bank accounts so if you're in your restaurant deposits from your your bank account move into your restaurant's bank account. But the the credit card networks are the ones that kind of route the messages to the banks saying, you know, hey, Paul's trying to pay X, Y, and Z. So, so if, if the credit card networks go down, um, you know, the banks, uh, is, like your whole sort of like payment system freezes. And this happened in the UK. All these people were trying to like move around and the visa system went down and suddenly they were stranded. And of course, these were like, you know, fairly short you know, yeah, and I suppose those systems uh, get more resilient over time, right? So because of technological progress. Well, yeah, but they get more resilient, but they probably also then get increased risk of cyber attack. I mean, a as they become more and more powerful, they become bigger targets, True. right? So you kind of, if, if I was a security person, a national security person, I'd be thinking quite seriously, be like saying like, okay, like what are the, like the sort of national security risks to having your whole sort of economic system based off essentially these digital databases that can go down. Yeah, um, that's also why I, I, a lot of security experts who are very digital and they use computers the whole time are actually also quite often in favor of preserving cash mm -hmm. as, um, as a backup plan for, for when there's, an, yeah. there's down time with the, with the payment system. And I think part of the complexity about this is that there's definitely um, what's called the war on cash is basically this, the, the basic argument is that there are certain players who are pushing for the situation to occur. Like Visa in, in London, right? Yeah, well, there's a bunch of different players, right? So like there's the payments companies who make money off this because they get fees. There's the banks who are, don't want to deal with the cash system that they have to, have to run. Um, and then there's also government entities that want this. Yeah, because they want to be able to imp to um, uh, make sure we have negative interest rates on our bank accounts. Yeah, well, it's different. As, as as an, the, some, a, some of the like security people want to be able to watch transactions more closely. Some of the tax people want to be able to watch yeah. watch tax stuff. And then there's a kind of like you know negative interest rate monetary policy stuff. But the, what's interesting about about this war on cash concept is that. The original story told about cashless society was very much that it was just some kind of natural process, that just like there was everyone was just sort of just naturally wanted it. So like there wasn't it, there was there wasn't it was purely uh, what do you what do you call it, like demand driven, you know it was just because people. But in a way, it's true. Like, if you look at myself, I uh, I haven't been using cash for I guess for for months. Uh, am I complicit or am I just being naive? Or? Well, this is why I, I think it's a subtle it's a subtle thing. Like like I'm not saying that people don't. Uh, respond to these systems, but the question is who who originally puts it in front of you and says, "Hey, here, use this thing." The nudging. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there's this whole like interplay. Um, but if, if you talk to shop owners, they they also really like um, digital payments because they the chances of being robbed uh, are also reduced because of it. Um, not all shop owners. It depends on where you are in the world. Yeah, but I guess the majority of. Uh, most shop owners I talk to, like for example, I would go to a market stall, even the, all these guys have eyes set on all these uh, um, small devices, right? Mm -hmm. And they love it because it's, it's not a, they don't have the hassle anymore of bringing the money to the sure, bank yeah, at the yeah. end of the day. No, of course. So, so from an entrepreneur's perspective, if you're a person selling goods and services in, in a store, on average, I, I don't think it's actually as widespread as you because I think there's a lot of different stories that come out because you also get charged fees. They, they yeah, but they're relatively small compared to the fees I, that I the think, banks charge. I think in the Netherlands, like, yeah, like, okay. like, like I see, this is why I think it's, it changes depending on what country you're in. Um, but let's say that they, they often do see this kind of commercial advantage to it, and and they get to know the customer, right? Because normally they would only the, there was a payment, and they wouldn't necessarily know the name of their customer. And even small merchants uh, are also interested in big data or small data. But it, yeah, yeah. it's nice for them to, no, to understand sure. who's paying uh, and to also uh, have loyalty programs. And so in that, in that no, sense... Of course, there's many reasons why people actually sometimes find these systems useful. And I, I think like the, 
the, the full kind of picture will be something like there are some short term interests that ordinary people have towards like let's say the convenience. So on, on the buying side, maybe the convenience of it. On the selling side, like maybe it's safer for you. Maybe it's like you don't have to pay the costs of handling the cash and so on. Um, and then you got to then look at that with the um, the interaction with how the sort of digital payments industry has pushed itself into these, these situations, but also the fact that the state has actively tried to assist the digital payments industry in this process. So a lot of that in the, in the UK, for example, the British state is very like keen on supporting this move and are helping these companies push into this kind of um, push people more and more into that realm, um, which I think is a very irresponsible thing to do because fine, some individual entrepreneur might decide it's in their personal interest to stop allowing cash. But if you're, if you're taking a, a wider view and you're thinking about the resilience of your monetary system, you're thinking about how do you make sure that everybody's able to engage in the economy, you should be saying, actually, you should always retain an option for people to use cash. Otherwise, you're going to be excluding people. Otherwise, you're going to be subjecting us on to you know, risks if it all goes down. But you sound a bit like a 19th century Luddite, right? You're just trying to sort of fighting the, the industrial no, 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 revolution. No, no, not at all, not at all. Actually, the best, the best um, I, I think I sound more like a pragmatic uh, sort of um, think about how you balance an economy, you know? Like, and th th think about the way that the digital payments industry thinks. Like, the, their basic impulse is like, we want to make more money, right? It's like a private sector organizations. Like, so they have all the interest in the world in presenting people like me as being Luddites. Right? Just saying, you know, oh, he's just stuck in the past. Whereas I'm like, no, 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 you guys have a very partial view that's, that's geared towards com supporting your commercial interests. What I'm doing is actually showing you a more holistic p picture. Um, and, and one of the best analogies for this is the transportation industry. And I've been talking about this quite a lot in this, these type of debates. If you go back into the early 1900s when automobiles first came out, um, the first thing that the car industry did was they, uh, they, they attacked the horse-drawn cart lobby. All right, So they, were, they basically lobbied to have the, the rules of the road changed such that horse-drawn carts would be pushed off and that the cars could take over. Right? And they called themselves horseless carriages. So it's like, oh, we're not encumbered by these old you know, horses. Get off the roads, basically. Right? And, and actually, right now, the digital payments industry talks about cash like that. They're like, oh, we're cashless. Like, get that you know, old system off the road. But what I always say is like, look at bicycles. I mean, you, you live in a country that has the, the highest, probably one of the highest uses of bicycles in the world. Bicycles preceded cars. And bicycles are still used nowadays. And people l value them precisely because they provide resilience and balance to a transportation yeah. system. That's a, it's, it's, I think it's a nice an, an analogy. What I, what I wonder though is the, the argument for why governments are, are um, pushing this agenda. Like I would, I would expect governments to at least uh, come up with a digital equivalent of cash. So at the moment, mm -hmm. we of course, have here, like in Holland, we have euros, the cash, uh, the coins and the, and the notes, and then we use bank money. But then when cash is slowly but surely uh, disappearing from society, and then you would expect the government to say, okay, look, this is something we used to provide to our citizens, uh, like finality, no third party, um, uh, all these things. Mm -hmm. Can't we just come up with a anonymous digital alternative so people can still use something as cash without having to use the commercial banks but it would be in a digital form and in that yeah. way we can i think we can sort of solve quite a few of the issues you have no, uh, sure. of course you would still you would still be depending on electricity and power and 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 of course the government can then also impose negative interest rates and yeah. But at least, at least you get you get to preserve some of the elements of cash. Sure. So like, let's 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 sketch out the, the categories that, that are available to us. So, right now the system is, we have bank, digital money, and state cash. Okay. You could have. Uh, and with the cryptocurrencies, let's let's, let's use all three. Okay. okay. Yeah. Well. Okay. With the market. Let's 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 leave cryptocurrency out for now. Okay. Okay. So like the battle right now is between state cash and, Bank I mean, in the case of EU, obviously, it's, it's a bit complicated. Let's just, let's just call it state cash for now, okay? Yeah. Government cash. Yeah. Um, battle between bank digital and government cash. But if you suddenly make a digital version of go government uh, 
currency, you suddenly have a third a third category involved, yeah. and that that like central bank digital currency. Yeah, so that, that changes the whole landscape. Yeah. Now, like and we can discuss why, why, but like a lot of states, let's say like we like in Sweden. I mean, this is this is which is one of the most you know uh, society that has the highest level of of cashlessness. Only one percent is paid in cash. There, only one percent. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're actually getting concerned about this, right? Precisely for these various reasons I've been saying. Like the like the the, the central bank is suddenly like, yo, you know, we actually, you know, we, we like to support the banking industry and the digital payments industry, but also we have at least ostensibly we we got some public mandate to protect the public interest right. as well. Yeah. So we at least have to think about like what happens if like whole numbers of people get excluded from the payment system because the banks weren't do this and so on and like all these issues. So like they're starting to think about digital cash. Yeah, what if someone starves because he can get food with his cash, and then there's a, a huge liability for, yeah, so for like, any central bank, right? And actually, I think you know, like uh, Visa is not going to get like hounded on the street by people, you know, like um, I mean, basically, the government will be the one which will take the brunt of public backlash. Yeah, sure, because Visa is just pursuing its commercial interests. Yeah. like any company is, of course, trying to promote its products. Yeah, Visa's kind of got the sort of very Visa for for trying to roll out uh, their system. Yeah, so it's got this very kind of narrow sort of view in some way. So like in the end, like the real like brunt of the stuff will, will come back to like politicians or these various like well, bureaucrats of various sorts, which is why they have to like in general you can be as you can be as like you know cynical as you want about about different politicians, but they at least have to think about this kind of stuff, right? Actually, when I was in I was in um, East uh, I was in Kenya speaking to a lot of East African policymakers on this. And the digital payments companies showed absolutely no concern about the, about privacy concerns. The only ones, the only people raising privacy concerns were the central bank people. Yeah, because M, M Pesa and Kenya is being used by the majority now, right? Most, I guess, most transactions are are taking place in no, not not most, but yet. like, but this this applies to say Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania. There's a lot of these digital money systems, right? Yeah. And of course, there's these private actors who are running those who really just don't show very much interest at all in like the sort of privacy implications. So actually it comes down to the central banks to be like, hey guys, you should actually have to think about this because at least they, they sort of have to think about this kind of broader public interest question. So yeah, there might actually be a point where states to say, if we do go to a cashless society or a bank payment society, um, we're going to have problems. And if so, we're going to have to essentially provide some kind of state alternative, some digital state money um, which would then introduce this sort of state digital money system. And then the question is, you know, how do you want to design that? Do you want to make sure it's anonymous? Is yeah. it going to be like... Because a lot of, uh, also in The Economist recently, there was another article, uh, Mark Carney was talking about it. Everyone is sort of trying to warm up the audience for the eventual uh, inevitable introduction of uh, digital state money. But then I'm sure uh, they will use all arguments available to make sure it will be account-based. Mm -hmm. So everyone gets an account instead of wallet based because if it would have been like, sure. if it's if it's an anonymous wallet or a pseudonym anonymous, but at least if there's some degree of privacy for for the user, then uh, that will be such a missed chance for them because they have an opportunity to completely uh, um, to completely spy on on, on the whole um, society. And I, I don't think they will they will let go of that chance. Yeah, it's I mean, such a it's, good so yeah, those the but, 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 that's a big but th th there's there's a I think there's a bigger question before this is that the if states were to actually go forward and start issuing their own digital currency, the banks I think would lobby very very hard against it. Like I think the banks would be very upset if the state, you know, floated this idea. Because what would start to happen is that people in the public would start to say to themselves, wait a moment, the, well, right now the only way I can do digital payments is if I have a bank account, right? So I have to have these banks. Um, and then there's a cash system. But what happens if I could actually bypass the banks and go s use the state money system directly by using state digital currency? Why should I have a bank? Well, you very know. simple, because in a, in a bank you still have some yield, even though the interest rates are very small. But I'm sure the state will always make sure that there's a difference between what you get on the state account and what you'll get on a bank account. So there's an incentive for anyone sure, to... Sure, but to I mean, but like, it, that depends. I mean, do people, do people really, do, it does like, you know, fine, if you've got a very large amount of money in your bank account, maybe you're thinking about that, that yield. But a lot of people who like operating on, you know, I guess, on lower incomes and stuff especially, 
don't aren't thinking, you know. It's like, like, it's like you know, at the end of the year, they've made you know what, like you know, ten, you know, ten euros or something, or you know, maybe like slightly more. But like, so I don't necessarily think that's going to be the main. Uh, so, but suddenly, you do hypothetically, if a state was to issue its own digital currency, you might say, actually, in the middle of a financial crisis, why am I? Why do I have a bank account? Let me just hold state money directly, rather yeah. than so the yeah. banks. But then the government can say you can. You're only allowed to hold a, an X amount of state money. I'm sure they will come up with all sorts okay. of tricks. Uh, well, but you know what would be an interesting, an interesting question. So, like, let's say um, there's a digital um, euro, or there's like a digital pound, or a digital dollar available. Um, or digital bank, or I'm sure they're going to do it globally. Once once they do it, and I'm sure okay, there will well, be global plans. Maybe you can maybe you can answer this question for me. Okay, so you you let's let's say the UK government decides at some point. Um, well, actually, let's say the Swedish government because maybe they, they they're potentially the closest to kind of doing this. They say we're going to issue this this digital krona. Um, now, what happens if I'm a person who lives outside of Sweden? Can I download this like wallet and start holding digital krona outside of the country, um, or will it be some like restricted to Swedish people only? Will it be like if only you can only use this if you're within the boundaries of Sweden? Right now, with the cash system, like basically that the state money doesn't really very easily no, leave leave the borders, so. right? But suddenly, if you're like well, yeah. and the, the most the most U.S. dollars are held outside of uh, of the United States, so in that sense, it's already very much. Has spread well, across the world. What do you mean the cash? Yeah, the cash, yeah. Okay, sure. But the US dollar has a particular sort yeah. of role in the world. So that's maybe, you know, it's got this kind of reserve currency status and stuff. But like, I'm just wondering, like, what, what, what rules would they place on, 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 on people? I'm sure they would, they would pilot it first with uh, only Swedish um, citizens or Swedish residents, possibly foreigners living in Sweden. Mm -hmm. And then they will probably expand and by also allowing uh, non residents to hold some balance but they will limit it to let's say uh, a few thousands kronas yeah, in yeah. that sense they can they can control it because it's really if we're talking about marginalized groups if we're talking about elderly uh, refugees they don't need l big amounts anyway of this digital uh, equivalent and i'm sure also in order not to endanger the banking system they will never allow big amounts like i was involved in holland and i'm still am uh, trying to set up a a full reserve bank that can mm -hmm. be added to the fractional reserve system. And also there, we've said many times to, to the government, uh, who are very re reluctant to introduce this, we're saying, look, you can, you can cap the amount. You don't necessarily have to be afraid of, of bank runs if you just make sure that people cannot hold large amounts. It's, yeah. it's just very simple. And then over time, you can, make, you can uh, get some experience and, and come up with a, with a perfect... Uh, Equilibrium. Yeah. Well, I mean, as far as I can see, if we look at the monetary reform movements, so, like, on the, on the one hand, there's this debate around cashless society, should the state, in response to this, start to issue its own digital currency and so on. Um, and then there's this interesting, like, strategic question for monetary reform groups. So, for example, the, like, the positive money groups, which are, you know, advocating sort of uh, these sovereign money systems or Probably what used to be called full reserve banking, which they're slightly different, right? But yeah. like, but like, um, and you know, to to my eyes, and, and I, I see groups like Positive Money right now are promoting state digital currency, and to me that looks like like the way that you would actually um, s essentially weaken the power of the banks. It's a kind of like an intermediary step. So Positive Money's original story was prevent m banks from being able to issue you know, bank money, credit money um, with the fractional reserve system or credit creation of money. But that's politically unfeasible, right? If you go to the British government exactly. and, you, and you say, hey, stop, take away the banking licenses and stop these like, incredibly powerful corporations from, from issuing money, of course, they're not going to do it. But that's it's, too big of a risk. Exactly. But if you say, hey, why don't you issue this sort of alternative, which will... Like, In addition to, yeah, of course, that, that, that's the way to do it. Yeah. But uh, so I th I, readers should, or a viewer should check your uh, latest article on Huffington Post, which you uh, shared on Twitter. Oh, yeah, yeah. Because there you have a nice overview of the different uh, monetary alternatives. Yeah, Be yeah. Before we wrap up, wrap up, it would be nice to also talk about uh, the, um, the cryptocurrencies. Like, briefly, uh, do you think um, because of the... Uh, disappearance of cash in society, and, and I really hope that we still have some cash, uh, like proper cash, uh, in society for for many years to come. Uh, because I share many of your concerns, but do you think the the crypto bros can uh, come up with, uh, um, or do you think cryptocurrency is already mature enough to 
possibly fill in the void uh, of, of some of the um, anonymous use cases or some of the use cases of the of, of the I mean right right now groups cryptocurrency it, it it's it doesn't operate like money at all probably like the, the closest thing you could say is it's a, it's like a quasi money so, so, so like, 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 a, like a money like token but it's not really like a monetary system right like it's it's a, they're digital tokens you can pass around between people um, but something just being a digital token doesn't make it into money all right like it needs widespread acceptance it needs to have stability there's a whole bunch of things that go into making your monetary system work um right now it does have a sort of sort of like a may sound like a banger in a way uh, well i mean well there's the the original alternative currency communities understood this yeah. right the cryptocurrency community has got a very different understanding of money to a lot of the other original counter movements like the money. local currencies and the yeah yeah i mean cryptocurrency wasn't the first attempt yeah. to change the bank money system right um but it's it's like it has a particular sort of view on money and um they <coughs> so so the, the big problems are one it has a, it, it really doesn't like for the for the everyday person if you go up to them and like you know let's say like in, i go to in south africa where i'm from and, and i say to somebody like oh you know hey don't worry cryptocurrency will, will, will help you it's like it's so unrealistic for so many people or it's just it's just not on their radar at all all right so like hypothetically maybe one day it will do that but for somebody to come to me and say oh don't worry this problem is solved right now by cryptocurrency it's just not true um secondly like it has these huge scaling problems right like you it's 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 far too small to deal with the sheer number of transactions that people do in the world um so right now cryptocurrency really doesn't offer anything other than a kind of like a vague future story about it's it might but do you believe the story? You think we will eventually uh, get to a point that we are uh, neither using state money nor using bank money, but we're using global decentralized uh, currencies? Not in the current form that cryptocurrencies take. Uh, I, I really don't, and this would take a long discussion of like monetary theory. You should probably save it for a second. But I think there is like some day. deep, deep structural flaws in the way that the existing cryptocurrency community thinks about money. And it's one of the things that hampers them the most. So actually in that article that I was writing for the Huffington Post, which, I, which is called um, uh, Five Monetary Rebellions or something like that, like um, uh, I was saying this, you know, like so cryptocurrency, like the, the, the profound thing about it was this, you know, you can issue tokens and move them between people without a central party, okay? But it's retained all this extremely conservative thinking about money, very like kind of old school thinking about money um, that's really like holding it back. And I think what would be very, very powerful is if you hybridized those cryptocurrency systems with some of the thinking that comes out of the original alternative currency movements, such as like mutual credit systems, um, people don't know mutual credit systems very well, but mutual credit systems are, they're sometimes called, you know, let systems and so on. Very small scale alternative money systems, but have very interesting thinking on money. And I think if you had to sort of like fuse those two together, you got something very interesting. And I think that would be something that would make central banks actually be like, okay, this maybe concerns us. Um, it's right? an interesting theme to, to explore. Yeah, yeah it's, maybe uh, for another, another maybe chat. Maybe for another time, yeah. Uh, but I don't think central banks right now aren't concerned about cryptocurrency supplanting them by any means. Um, they view it as just a speculative asset on a, on a fiat currency market. And that's how it operates. So the central bank digital currency is, is more, uh, that's, that's a topic they're more sort of... Central bank digital currency would blow crypto or, out of the yeah. water right now. I mean, if, 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 if you know, Bitcoin people struggle to get people to start using Bitcoin. But if the British, you know, government was saying like, hey, here's a digital, a digital pound potentially implemented using sort of some crypto architectures, people would be like, oh, cool, let me download the wallet right now. Like sure, but it could also <laughs> be an impetus for uh, even more interest in uh, other digital currencies that are non-state issues, non-state. Sure, sure, yeah. But I'm just saying, like, we don't underestimate the power of these, like, existing monetary systems. I think one of the problems in the cryptocurrency community is that they sort of chronically underappreciate the sheer power of the banking sector and the central banking systems. They, they, so that they make these big claims like, oh, these are imminently on their way out in the face of cryptocurrency. And it's yeah. like, okay. I, th I think by now, like I've been in that industry for, or in that community for many, many years. And I, I think it, it's sort of, 
over time people understand it will take much more time than, than yeah. they originally thought and and but the problem just, is but it's nice to see that there's so much going on there's so many things are being built so many sure. different but um, I, maybe protocols are being tested so yeah let's see maybe the last thing i'll say on that is that i'm very positive about the crypto world if it is able to update its its thinking around money and get more experimental because i think it's been far too stuck in this old sort of commodity thinking about money. But if, if you could move away from that, you got some super interesting stuff coming around the corner from that, for okay. sure. So that's that's pretty interesting. Great. Thanks, Brad. I know, I know you have a conference in, in Holland this uh, this weekend, in Rotterdam. Uh, yeah, tomorrow. It's um, called Balance? Balance and Balance. Okay. So cool. I'm doing a money workshop and we're doing, I'm talking about the different sort of, um, uh, the, the, the dynamics of cryptocurrency relative to other alternative currencies. Great. Well, I look forward to uh, seeing those videos. Great. Thanks, Brad. Good seeing Thanks you. Thanks so much.